Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Uh, once again, I have this wonderful privilege that EWTN gives me after all these years. They uh, allow me to sit with you and hear a story of conversion, how the Holy Spirit opens someone's heart and mind to the beauty of our Lord Jesus Christ and His church. And uh, often that's not where they thought they were going to end up, but we'll find out in a little bit. Our guest is Megan Silas, a former non-denominational evangelical. Megan, welcome to The Journey Home. Thank you so much, Marcus. It's a pleasure to be here. And before we begin, I just have to say congratulations on 20 years of the program. <laughs> it's such a beautiful ministry, and I know you've touched so many lives, including my own, so thank you. Well, thank you. It, it has been a wonderful privilege that EWTN has, I think, allowed it to keep going mm -hmm. on and on and on, mm -hmm. but I think it's because the Holy Spirit Amen. keeps bringing guests Amen. to the program. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what makes the program possible. So, mm -hmm. well, let me get out of the way. And okay. I invite you to, <laughs> yeah. to take us on the journey. All right. Well, it's so fun to hear those classic <laughs> words coming out. Let me get out of the way. So, yes, let me begin. So, I was um, born in northern New York near the border of Canada, about as close to being Canadian as you can get without uh, actually being a citizen. And if I say A or <laughs> pronounce things a little funny, I still have a, a bit of that left Were in Were you me. up there because your family had come down or because your family had gone My up? My family always lived there. My parents oh, okay. both grew up, in there, grew up there. They were uh, high school sweethearts and uh, lived pretty much their whole lives and still live there okay. uh, now. So, you know, they're, they're Entire existence That's way, up there. way up there. Yeah, yeah. when people say, um, you know, upstate New York, and they're referring to right out of New York City, I'm like, okay, there is a whole bunch more of the state than that. And so, uh, but it was a beautiful place to grow up. A very rural, um, very uh, sort of small town feel. Um, you know, just intimate communities, that sort of thing. And so, it was a, a lovely place to grow up. Um, I can't say I enjoyed the cold that much, but uh, <laughs> other than that, it was, it was really, really nice. And um, so the family that I was born into, I'm a second child of three, and uh, my parents, uh, my mom was raised Catholic. Her father um, was an Italian immigrant, and so uh, there was actually fairly, even though it's a very small town, all the way up there in Northern New York, there was a very significant Italian community mm -hmm. in the town that um, my parents grew up in, and so that was very uh, much a big part of her upbringing uh, and so I think though it was it wasn't that there she came from a Catholic faith that was very vibrant or anything it was but it was very much a part of their culture mm -hmm. okay. and right. um, my dad on the other hand um, was raised by very devout Methodist my, my my grandmother was such a special, beautiful, <laughs> saintly woman, really, and uh, all through my life was a, a beautiful example of Christian living. Just one of those quiet people who just doesn't need to bring attention to themselves and just lives the faith beautifully. And so he came out of that, but I think as they came together as a couple, um, neither of them had a great impulse to bring one or the other with them. Uh, this was by the time they got married, it was the Catholic Church wasn't saying you had to convert anymore, so my dad didn't convert. And my mom wasn't, you know, particularly um, attached to her faith. I think um, growing up in sort of that post-Vatican II confusion, yeah. you know, it was a lot of, you must do this, you must do that, and then it just all kind of fell away, so she didn't hold on to it. So. Yeah. When I was a lot born, of people were kind of wondering, well, what what next shoe will fall? Right, so they're exactly. Just so just kind of hold off, right? Yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. Um, so when I was born, they weren't really doing much uh, anything as far as practicing a faith. Hmm. Uh, they both claimed to be Christians, believed you know in Christ, but it wasn't you know a significant part of their lives. Now, interestingly, all three of the kids in my family were all baptized Catholic. Okay because hmm. the family pressure. It, you know, it's, if you have an Italian grandmother, <laughs> an Italian great-grandmother <laughs> living around, you're going to get baptized. And one of my <laughs> earliest memories, actually, is of my brother's baptism. He, I'm, he's almost exactly four years uh, younger than me. And I remember it happened at our house, and a priest came and baptized him on the dining room table <laughs> of our house. Really? Yeah. Huh. And, and there's a picture to confirm that this memory is real. <laughs> and uh, so it is really one of my earliest memories of his baptism. But also when I was four, uh, very soon after that, my parents had a real conversion experience, you know, which they describe as being saved, being born again. I, mm. I kind of refer to it as a conversion experience that was extremely profound in their lives. Um, mm. 
from watching TV or no, going to someone's more, church or friends, home meetings, okay. home Bible studies. Very much, you know, this is right at the end of the '70s when the Jesus movement was really yeah. going and very charismatic and, and everything. And so they had friends that were going to meetings like that, and so they started going and just, you know, really became on fire for Christ. And another one of my very early memories is. Um, we used to say uh, bedtime prayer together. You know, my dad would come up and say prayers with my sister and I. And uh, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord myself to keep right. You know that prayer. Yeah. And one night he came up, and you know we're about to sh you know launch into the prayer. <laughs> he said, "No, we're not going to pray that anymore. We're going to talk to Jesus from our hearts now, and we're just going to pray to Him like a friend." And okay, <laughs> that's a whole new paradigm. And our life then became much more ordered around church. So my parents were uh, sort of founding members, one of the founding members of a church that started in our community. Hmm. And uh, it was my childhood was completely infused with, I, I, you know, people say evangelical, some people say charismatic, some people say fundamentalist. I say, why choose? It was all of them, <laughs> all of them, very charismatic hardline fundamentalist. I mean, they were interpreting that Bible strictly. Women were wearing coverings on their hair, you know, no contraceptives, some contraceptives, and you know, the whole nine yards. So in a way, like looking back on it, well, they weren't too far off from, you know, right. a lot of Catholic, you know, life and belief. And But um, so they were very engaged in that. And um, it's interesting how my mom never really talked about her parents' like response to this, um, but I do think they were a little mm -hmm. hands off uh, about Probably it. Probably both sides, concerned. right? The Catholic yeah. side as well as the conservative Methodist well, side. Well, I don't know about, yeah, that's it's probably both sides, but my dad's side, like, it was more like they would never have talked about it. I'm sure on the Catholic side, <laughs> the more Italian way of being, they might have gotten a little more uh, words about it, but. Um, so that was, you know, so much a part of my childhood. And uh, interestingly enough, even though there were a lot of Catholics around in my life, there's still, you know, the family members, and we also had this wonderful neighbor, uh, neighbors that lived next door, which were uh, Quebecois, French Catholics, and uh, they had a beautiful, large family, and they were very close to us. So I had that influence. But um, the experience of the Catholic that actually stands out most in my mind as a child has to do with unfortunately a negative uh, experience where my dad as part of his uh, you know sort of evangelical fervor um, he also raced motorcycles and he started uh, this motorcycle group called Team Jesus and they would go around together and uh, they would race motorcycles and sort of evangelize it, it, as they would and you know a lot of the young guys in the town were excited about that and so they got involved and so so one of the um, young men um, converted, you know, kind of became uh, an evangelical Christian, largely due to my dad's witness. And um, one day, his mother showed up at our door, just beside herself. What have you done? What have you done to my son? You've draw drawn him out of the church. You know, you are br pulling him into a cult. You know, what are you doing? Just fear and anger. Yeah. And I was very shocked by that like mm. as a young child because you know I could only see my parents as good and, and right. our faith is beautiful and was vibrant and um, so I didn't understand it at the time it's interesting because I've looked back on it now and I see like I understand her fear, her fear. like now the way she kind of went about it I don't agree with right. but I understand the fear of, of her son being drawn out of something that she found so profoundly important and true. Yeah, which is interesting because so. your your parents probably didn't appreciate or understand where she was coming from, right? And vice versa. Yes, I, I, yeah. It you wasn't know, there wasn't a dialogue happening here. It, it, was it just probably like, wasn't even able to happen right, because they yeah. didn't have metal file folders for mm -hmm. each other's sure. understanding of Christianity exactly. it was so radically different. Exactly. Yeah. But what I would say about growing up in that tradition that, you know, and, and I know a lot of people who sit in this chair talk about the same thing, is just there's so much love for Christ that I grew up around. Right. Joy in their faith, devotion to living it passionately, no matter what that meant. If that right. meant being totally radically separated from the culture, so be it. 
because Christ calls us to this. And, and so, and like and, for, and a seriousness about the a word. A very seriousness about the word of God. Um, yeah. Real scripture study, you know, just going deep. And, you know, it's funny when people complain about mass going long or whatever, you know, it's over an hour 15 and someone's losing it. I'm like, I went to two hour long, <laughs> you know, services. It, we had 45 minutes of worship and an hour long sermon. You can unpack a lot of stuff if you have an hour long sermon. Right, so there was exactly. a lot of teaching, a, a lot of, um, but that teaching um, was pretty much exactly based on whatever the pastor felt was his interpretation of scripture. Uh, and that was just as it was. And it was very much a, and very charismatic. So however the Holy Spirit guides you to interpret this is, you know, um, reasonable. But the interesting thing is, is that despite that, it could also be very dogmatic where, well, at this church, this is what we do and what we believe. And so, but, but what if the Holy Spirit's leading? Well, no, we believe this here, but okay. So they tried to have it both yeah. ways a little bit. And they would have said that, well, this is what the Bible says. Right. And, yeah. and I'm not being cynical or critical no. of them. Their understanding of scripture, this is what the Bible says and this is where we were at. Are they not? Right. They may not have seen that they were seeing the Bible through the lenses of their own exactly. yeah. experience. And then if if the people of that church aren't going from Sunday to Sunday visiting other places, mm -hmm. they don't know that what's being taught in that church is radically different right. than other churches. Right. True. You yeah. Know, this is they don't your... have that frame of reference. Right. right. Exactly. So you know, we so growing up in that, um, I have to admit, I never really felt home there. Mm -hmm. Like I did feel that there was something that was missing for me. I loved worship, like the music, um, you know, it's very much what we would consider sort of contemporary Christian music now, but that m praise and worship atmosphere where you're, you know, just crying out to the Lord in, in song together was, is very powerful. And uh, I, I still appreciate that to this day. Um, but uh, some of the charismatic gifts were a bit of a struggle for me, not because I didn't believe in them, but that I felt there was almost a bit of a pressure yeah. to receive them. Um, and so I know that they would have prayer over people to try to receive the gift of tongues and, and things like that. And as a, as a high school student, I, I just, I didn't have it. Like it wasn't coming to me and I wasn't going to fake it. So I felt a little bit like it was my failing. Like I, something was in my faith was lacking that I couldn't receive this gift. So there was that sense of discomfort. But there also wasn't any sense that you had to go to church either, which is interesting. It was a very close knit community, but sometimes we just be like, well, we'll have home church and read the Bible together and, and things like that. So that sense that it is very much a me and Jesus thing, even though we have this community that's tight knit, it really is about your relationship with Christ. And that's all you need um, was part of that experience. Our guest is uh, Megan Silas. Those things you've just mentioned, all those kind of emphasize um, I hate to use the word danger, but but you know, for a small churches right. like that, and how you interpret scripture, whether whether those gifts are necessary mm -hmm. or not to salvation, right? You know, whether yeah. it's necessary to go to church or not, or why you're going to mm -hmm. church, or or if you stood before God tonight and had to answer for your life, uh, yeah. whether it's just knowing Jesus or whether, right. you know, it, it's all dependent on that little group mm -hmm. and where that pastor. Now, yeah. did you have one pastor during that entire period or multiple? No, it was pretty much one pastor. Yeah. When we, we moved from one town to another town, and so we ended up going to a, another church that had been a break off from the same church. So we, I had two pastors basically, but they were all in lockstep. Yeah. So okay. there wasn't a lot of confusion there. My parents weren't moving around. But the interesting thing is my, I did sense that um, there was some discomfort on my mom's side as well. And I think a lot of it just had to do with almost a, a social thing because uh, she wasn't maybe, she wasn't homeschooling and doing some of these things that some of the other families were doing. So she maybe felt a little bit of an outsider. Mm. Um, so every now and then, and I, and I cleared this with her to make sure I was remembering this correctly. <laughs> uh, I would hear her say, I think I'm just going back to the Catholic church. And I would hear those words and I was like, what are you, what are you talking about? Because you know, so much of um, my understanding of the Catholic church was that the word it's dead was used a lot. Um, it wasn't so much that um, there was this sense that it was, you know, they weren't Christian or whatever, but it was dead. The spirit wasn't moving there. So the idea of why would you go back to the dead church, you know, that was kind Which of. Which might have been said of, of mainline Protestantism too. Uh, yeah, absolutely, you know, yeah. for sure. Um, so. I mean, from that perspective. From that perspective, From that perspective, absolutely. you could have looked at, yeah. Yeah. 
So I went to boarding school for the last two years of high school. So that kind of moved me out of my home life. So now, you're, again, your faith becomes a little more your own, right, when you're making decisions about whether you're going to go to church or not. And interestingly enough, when I went to boarding school, I did not go to church anymore. But I was a leader in the Christian Fellowship Group. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it did not have to be, you know. Was it a Christian thing. boarding school? No, no, it was oh. a, it's an academic boarding school okay. um, right. in New Hampshire. And uh, so it was just a matter of that's what I used as my sort of faith community was the, the student group. and uh, But it, it was an interesting time because I wasn't going to church. I'm a leader in this Christian fellowship group. And so much of it is just, you know, me reading my Bible on, on my own. I all through my life, I have been very curious about God, read a lot, read the Bible a lot, um, just felt very drawn to wanting to know more. Mm -hmm. Now, I wouldn't say that I had a prayer life that was profound, though. I, I always felt that I was lacking in prayer. Like, I should be feeling something, mm -hmm. but I wasn't feeling anything. And so much around me, the externals were that people seemed to be feeling a lot. And I was feeling a, quite a bit empty when I would pray, but but I just I had to go in and, and read it, the word and. Plus, way back when, and they tried to get you to speak in tongue, and you failed. And I failed. Yeah, so, so I mean, that, again, yeah. that would have left you wondering, maybe exactly. more, more self doubt mm -hmm. about your spiritual journey. Yeah, but the, I think the interesting thing is when I was in high school, probably the most profound, prayerful experiences I would have is that I had, for some reason, a love for sacred music choral music, Gregorian chant, these things. And I had a couple cassettes. And <laughs> when I was feeling upset or just feeling like somehow I needed some communion with God, I would take my cassette player and I would go out into the fields of the boarding school and lay under the stars and listen to Gregorian chant. And so you know, you're looking back, you're like, oh, maybe a little bit of a seed there. Especially, and I was also taking Latin all through high school. That was my foreign language. I was taking Latin. So, you know, that sort of flavor works its way in. So after high school, um, move on to university and um, I'm pre-med. So very busy at Princeton University. So, you know, you're busy. There's a lot. And, you know, I haven't been going to church anyway, so I'm not going to start going to church now. But I, you know, was involved in this Christian fellowship. So I started trying out a couple of the Christian fellowship groups at college. And it just, I was not feeling it. And I remember one time there was a conversation happening. And I wasn't part of the conversation, but I was listening. And somebody was sort of asking a bit of a challenging question. And the person was responding, well, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. And I, I sat back and I listened to that. And I was like, you know, it's a bit circular reasoning. If your whole argument is based on a book that they don't necessarily accept, you're kind of limited. <laughs> you're, you don't really have a lot to go from there. You, you've come to the place where you accept this or you don't, and that's the end of the story. Yeah. And that's really all I had growing up. Well, there was no sense of any connection to history or anything like that. It's just that. You just need that, <laughs> and uh, it all will be clear. And so that experience, that one moment was very profound to me because it was the first time I ever actually doubted. doubted uh, it's like, wait a second, why do I believe? That's a big chunk and uh, chink in the foundation it if you is. start to, to start questioning the, mm -hmm. the authority of Scripture. Right. Like, yeah. You know, um, yeah. why do I believe any of it? You know, but I didn't really go too dark, far down that path. It was like, that scared me a little bit. But it was enough to be like, I don't think I want to be involved in <laughs> any of these Christian groups. And I, I'm just going to do my studies. And that's what I did. And, you know, I was focused on my studies. I uh, met my husband, what would come to be my husband in um, at university. And, uh, you know, I told, you know, I would say, you know, I'm a Christian and this part of, you know, who I am. And he's like, great, fine. You know, I, I'm, he grew up. I'm Presbyterian, so we were both kind of just Christians who weren't really doing much about it at that point. Um, after leaving Princeton, I went on to medical school, and it's sort of an interesting time because my husband, my he was kind of not officially, but pretty much my fiance at that point. <laughs> He's down in Delaware. I'm up in Syracuse, New York, and so we're doing this long distance thing. And so I'm in medical school, and obviously very very intense, a lot of work. So again, I'm not going to church. <laughs> like it's not on the on the schedule. But the interesting thing about medical school is I um we I had a little study group. It was me and three other people. 
uh, myself and one other Protestant guy, and then two Catholics, a guy and a girl who are Catholic. And every now and then we'd get into some discussions. Uh, they, they were kind of like jovially ribbing each other. There wasn't any true deep theological seeking here, but it was kind of like, you know, you would make a joke about them and they'd make a joke about us and, and things like that. Um, and I actually uh, just recently got in touch with my friend from uh, medical school, the girl who is uh, Catholic. I was like, you know what? Did y'all go to mass? I don't know. I don't remember. I had no recollection of if they were actually yeah. practicing their faith in that way of you know being engaged in the sacraments. And she said, oh yeah, a group of us used to meet and we'd walk to uh, the cathedral together in Syracuse. And I was like, I had no idea. <laughs> but, but one thing I will say is that we used to watch some of these television programs and uh, that were funny, you know, but very farce kind of things. And there was one there where um, they had Jesus as a character. It was a cartoon. And there was some, it was very negative, like making fun of mm -hmm. Jesus. And I remember the, the guy who was a Catholic, he said, like, that's not okay. And that is more than anything, like, impacted me that there was something profound, you know, about a boundary that you don't cross when it mm. comes to Jesus, yeah. you know. Um, so, and I look back on them, and but you know, there was I don't remember ever talking about the Eucharist or uh, as much as they clearly were devoted their faith. They weren't in any sense trying to say, "Why don't you come and check it out?" Okay. Uh, so it and didn't occur to me. In medical school, you probably encountered uh, medical ethical questions. Did that yeah. ever um, come up in the religious issue? It did, and an interesting that happened early, earlier on. Like I had a, the the abortion issue and things like that right. came up, and I was staunchly pro-life. Hmm. Um, my ethics were right down the line, you know, traditional Christian. Uh, all through medical school, um, just never deviated from that, despite the fact I wasn't really involved in my faith, engaged in it. But I was still, you know, reading the Bible every now and then, trying to say prayers before I went to bed every night, but usually fell asleep because you're so tired. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, it, it wasn't being lived out in any dynamic way. Um, but so it was just kind of in that like slow simmer. But interestingly enough, after I got out of medical school and in the end, decided not to practice medicine uh, and went to, uh, you know, I decided just, I didn't want it for my life. But as my, my, we got married, my husband and I ended up getting married in an Episcopal church simply because I was definitely going to have a Christian wedding, but I didn't really care what was going to happen. So we pretty much picked the cute church that we thought was pretty. <laughs> so that was, that was the decision making factor on that one. Um, so we were married and, you know, we have our first child. And interestingly enough, a lot of times when people have their first child, that's like brings them back to faith. Yeah. But I was like, okay. I'd never stopped thinking about it. It was, faith for me was something that, it would almost haunts me. Mm -hmm. Like, it's like, this is the important question. If you don't figure out anything else in life, this is the one you've got to figure out. And I hadn't figured it out. So I decided I'm going to start trying to figure this out. But when you try to do it under your own ability yeah. and not because I'm going to seek God in prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to infuse me with his grace. No, I'm going to intellectually <laughs> try to figure this out. So I just really started thinking and pondering and questioning and I pretty much thought myself in diagnosticism <laughs> because I just can't, it really came down to the fact that I was like, I look at a devout Muslim, I look at a devout Jew, I look, you know, all these people who are devout, they think they're right. They think they have the truth. What makes me think that I have the truth? Just because my parents taught it to me? Just because I have a book? They have a book. Who says? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I was, I remember once uh, having to read philosophy. I had not studied it and then having to read it again. And somebody asked me, well, what did you learn from philosophy? I said, well, the one thing you learned about philosophy is an awful lot of really intelligent people get it wrong. <laughs> I mean, that's right. the history of philosophy, uh -huh. you know. Yeah. You know, there's a, a lot of angles out there. Right. And if that's what you're looking at, like you said, if you're just looking mm -hmm. at that, it can be very discouraging. Yeah, I mean, the psalm comes to mind, lean not onto your own understanding. <laughs> and I was leaning pretty heavy on my own understanding at that point. I remember, like, sort of throwing out some of these ponderings to my husband. And he looked at me in his very stoic and engineering kind of mind and said, so your problem is you don't really quite understand what God's thinking. I was like, yeah, that's, that's kind of it. And he's like, 
good luck with that. <laughs> just like, you just, like, you're not going to figure it out. Why are you even bothering? So I, once I got to that point, we moved to Texas. We were living in Philadelphia at the time. We moved down to Texas. He started working as a um, engineering professor at Texas A&M, and I'd stopped working at that point. And I had a daughter, and I, you know, now I'm just, I'm going to do the mom thing. But I was, it was very interesting for me because I'm in this agnostic state, and I'm convincing myself that I'm good with it. Like, in fact, it, in a way, it's a little freeing because I'm just, I've decided I'm not going to question anymore. I'm just going to say, I don't know and be good with that. And I, so I stopped praying, which is, that's the first time, that was the only time in life that I had just stopped praying. I would always kept trying before, but the, there was one time I, a day I would pray just because I, I felt like I had to pray with my daughter and by, we had a, we had another child after that not that long and so I felt like I needed to give them a chance at faith because even though I had convinced myself I was okay I realized what I'd lost there was a sense of loss and I also didn't like to talk about it my agnosticism I, I would talk about it with a couple friends I knew had a similar bent and was okay with that I didn't like talking about it with people of faith and it wasn't because I was ashamed of it it was because I was afraid I might cause someone else to doubt. Hmm. And I didn't want to do that to someone. Like, I was like, I know that words can be powerful. And if you lead somebody down that path, I don't want, I don't want that to be on me. So I was kind of quiet about it and just sort of let it, let it be. And, and it was, and my husband, he was like, whatever, you know, he's just kind of let oh. me take the lead on that. I'm thinking maybe that's a good place to pause for our middle break okay. here, because there you are. There um, I am. The Bible had not been opened during this time? No, stop reading the Bible. Okay, so yeah. was, even the one source that you had based your mm -hmm. faith on up till then, you know, was kind of set aside, yeah. and I'm just going to figure it out. Hey, I mean, I've been to medical school. Right? I've been <laughs> yeah. to medical school. I ought to have a yeah. good handle, but we'll break there, and we'll okay. come back. But before we break, oh, I will sure, just sure. say this, that I, I had come to the point where I wasn't sure if God existed, but if I could get to that point, I would be a Christian. Like, it was, it, I don't know if that made sense, but it was like, okay, if I can get to the point I can believe in God, then I'll be back, go back to being a Christian. But it's the, I'm, I'm not sure about the whole thing at this point. Right. So. All right. Well, sometimes that's what God has to do to get our attention. Indeed. All right. We'll come back in a second. We'll pick it up there. See you. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and our guest tonight is Megan Silas. Um, you were saying that you were an agnostic, but if you could come to believe in God, you would. And so to me, that's one of the definitions between an agnostic and an atheist. Absolutely. I would never, ever have said I was an atheist. Because for me, it, at that point, it was basically like, <clears throat> it's hubris to think you've got it figured out. So to say one thing true, not, you know, is for sure you've got it. Because in my mind, I was like, okay, if there's a God, He's so big, so awesome, so unknowable that for any human to say, I've got it figured out is just, you know, yeah. beyond the pale. And you were going to keep praying with your children because you really hoped that they would have what you used to have. Right. Yeah. It was a little bit of that, that faith, yeah. that praise and worship. Sort of give them a chance. Yeah. Give them a yeah. chance. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where I am at. And at that stage in life, um, I, you know, I had fairly new to the community that we had moved into, and after a couple of years, started making friends and things like that. Interestingly enough, all my friends ended up being Catholic. <laughs> now, it wasn't that well, just worked out that way, but that wasn't something that, during this period of time, it was a big impact on me. It was just it was, and we didn't really get into it that much. And I, didn't, you know, like I said, I wasn't really talking about my lack of faith much, so it wasn't an issue. And but um, I did start to become very, very close friends w with one particular um, person. And during this uh, period, she developed some medical issues where she had debilitating migraine headaches. 
I mean, just the kind that you're in a dark room for hours on an end, and then you have like things that continue afterwards, like dizziness and, and things like that. She had four kids, and oh. you know, I just I loved her so much as a friend, and I, I wanted to help her uh, as much as I could. So I was sort of serving a lot um, in that capacity, but also, you know, when you have sort of trials like that that you go through with people it does I think increase your intimacy and you, you have lots of conversations and so I you know just, even though I had sort of settled in this agnosticism I still really didn't let it go the faith question was still always something I was wanting to talk about and she was a very strong Catholic not the kind that's like really super evangelical with their Catholicism that's just out there you know preaching it to the world but she lived it solidly I knew it was very important to her so we'd have a lot of questions and back and forth and I'd ask her you know things about their faith and and everything and she's always great about answering them and, and I think really wonderful about if she didn't know the answer just say I don't know but I'll figure it out for you I'll get back to you that kind of thing <laughs> which was great and so she appreciated my desire to be more of a, a probing kind of thing and didn't take it personally that I was like attacking her or anything because that wasn't my intention I just wanted to know more because really not because I want to know more about the faith itself I just want to know her more yeah. And it was part of who she was. And so in that stage, uh, I said, you know, I'd really like to go to Mass with you uh, because this is an important part of your life and I'd like to experience that with you. I had been to Mass in my life a couple times due to family functions or things like that. Didn't wasn't anything that was memorable or impactful to me. So, so one day she calls me up, she's like, okay, you want to go to Mass with me? Today's the day, I want you to come to Mass with me today. I went this morning and it was a great homily and I want you to come. I said, great, so I went. Feast of Corpus Christi. That's the mass she says she wants me to come to. So, you know, okay, here I am, Feast of Corpus Christi, and, you know, I'm getting a big old homily about Christ in the Eucharist and his real presence there. And it was this sort of thing where I knew um, the belief of transubstantiation that Catholics held. I never gave it a lot of thought, just kind of said, yeah, okay. And uh, so in my life, never really pondered it. Um, but, you know, I'm at this mass, and now there, I'm, I'm seeing the importance that they're placing on this, that it's not just, this isn't just one of their beliefs. This is the source and summit of their faith. And they're, you know, they're believing this, receiving this. And so I thought, okay, well, I need to look into this a little bit because I don't really get where the divergence happened. Because interestingly enough, I mean, you know, there's Catholic, you know, there's Protestant and the why, the how, at that point had never really occurred to me. Never thought to question it. And it's interesting when you think about your foundation, which was a very fundamentalist church. Right. You took the Bible seriously. Yeah. Probably didn't talk about John 6 very much. No, <laughs> that was not <laughs> something that, you know, we, right. that I remember hearing about. So that got me to start reading about the Reformation. I just wanted to know what happened. Hmm. And interestingly enough, when I was in high school, I had a very strong conviction at one point, I don't know where it came from. I think I, would, I read John chapter 17 at one point in high school. I read it, and that they may be one, that they may be one. And I thought, wow, he's really serious about this one thing. Hmm. And I thought, this thought came into my head in high school. If there is anything that breaks Christ's heart, it is the division in his church. Hmm. I never thought to question why the division was there or reach out to a Catholic or anything like that. I just thought that breaks his heart and that was it. But so now I'm back here and I'm looking at the Reformation, I'm reading and I'm here, you know, I kind of knew about Luther, but now I'm hearing names like Zwingli and, and learning about how Calvin differs from Luther and all these sort of things. And I'm like, wow, there's a lot here to unpack and things really weren't as straightforward as I always thought they were. You know, I started thinking, oh, I'm not sure Luther really originally really wanted it to go this far. And it, it, I don't really see a lot of other influences here beyond, besides just theology that were at play that led to this breakage. Mm -hmm. And then I also thought, okay, that I wanted to look at the Eucharist and, and how that changed within Protestant um, belief that it became a symbol instead of uh, a, a real presence. And I really did come to appreciate the historical belief of Christ's presence in the Eucharist. Did I believe it? No. But I came to respect it in a way that I hadn't before. I wasn't dismissing it any longer. And I thought, you know, wow, 
that's that's if you believe that it is a big thing and, and it does have support as, in historically so that's sort of where I'm at and my friend is still suffering and mm -hmm. at that point I went away to my family had a beach house and my in-laws and we would regularly go two three weeks in the summer and so it really broke me up to leave her in that situation that she's suffering so much I felt so helpless I'm going to have fun just play in the sand and surf and, and she's there still struggling and I thought what can I do there's nothing I can do and I thought well I could try to pray there's I could try so I tried and I felt like I was talking to myself I was just there's nothing here I'm not I'm just going through the motions it, it was empty and I was like well I tried so the next day, um, I go out to the beach with my daughter, who's, um, how old was she at the time? I think she was seven, seven at the time. No, eight, eight. And um, we're walking on the beach and we're looking for shells and everything. And uh, she picks up a shell. You know those like little mud clams that they're those little and they dig down in. Well, she found a little shell that was one of those, but it was open, and, but it was still together which is rare to find. So it was like little angel wings, right? And it had like these purple rays, you know, emanating from the center. And she, my little daughter held it up to me and she said, Mom, isn't this beautiful? And I looked at her and I said, yes. Isn't it amazing that happens by chance? <laughs> that just came out of my mouth. And it's at that moment that in that sort of way that's very hard to describe but if you've had it you know it the holy spirit just talked to my heart and said no it's not by chance i made it i made it all and it's time for you to come back and i was i mean i don't you don't really know how to deal with that in a moment and i just I was like okay that was something and so i you know, went back to, to the beach house and I kneeled on uh, at the foot of my bed and I just started to try to pray again and it was a very different experience this time. <laughs> I wasn't praying, I was getting a talking to. And it, what the Holy Spirit was saying to me was, I know you want to help your friend. You can't do that. Only I can do that. But you can come back. It's time. It's time. And I was like, yes, Lord. Okay. Okay. That's all it took. All the, that act, all the agnosticism, all the questioning, all the doubt. Yes, Lord. It, it's interesting that what the Lord used to awaken you was the, the moment of you being a channel to your daughter mm, yeah. of what you believed. Mm -hmm. He took you to utter this, right. yeah. this unbelief to your daughter, and mm -hmm. that's what he used. Right, and it's interesting, you know, today at Mass, we read anyone who, who leads someone astray, <laughs> it's better a millstone would be tied around their neck. And in uttering those words to my daughter, I was leading her astray. And God stopped me. In yeah. his mercy, he stopped me. Oh. And I'm so, so grateful for that. So, but that's not me becoming Catholic. That's right. me saying, I'm back to being right. a... Right. Protestant, and I'm I'm ready to go back to church, and so I, you know, okay, I told my husband, I was like, all right, you know, we're going back, we're going back to, I need to start going to church again. We should go as a family, and I told you know my Catholic friend, I'm, I believe in God again. Thank you so much for the role that you played in that, and she was happy and everything. So I started, you know, what any good Protestant does when they're look, you know, going to come back to faith and start going to church and do the church hopping, right? Start look going to the different churches, checking them out. And I, I realized, you know what? What's the difference between these? I mean, they have different names, but do I know anything about what defines Methodist spirituality? What defines Presbyterian, Lutheran, any of these? So then I started researching what do Protestants believe within their own faiths and seeing like these differences and just sort of coming, okay, well, I don't like that. I don't agree with that. So, okay, well, this one sounds good. But as we were going as a family and going to these different churches, it just didn't feel right. I didn't, it didn't feel, it, I was waiting for that click that, okay, this is the church home, the church home, you know, that's what everyone's looking for, right? The church home. I wasn't finding it. And my husband, he's, he's very like, 
he's not super emotional. He's he's pretty you know laid back, and he's he's kind of just goes with the flow. He's an engineer. He's an engineer, <laughs> <laughs> and so you know he was just responding, and yeah, I kind of like that. I didn't really like that, and so you know, so I was talking to my friend, and I was like, you know. Just none of these are really working for me. And she's like, well, you ask a lot of questions about the Catholic faith. Have you really ever considered becoming Catholic? And it's like, no, no. You know, my husband's Protestant. I'm Protestant. It's just such a break from, you know, I just really know. So she kind of left it. But then she came back at me and she said, uh, well, you know, I talked to you about you to my uncle who's a priest and he said maybe you should read this book called uh home sweet rome by scott hahn because he's you know kind of struggled with a lot of this stuff and you know converted but you know it might answer some of the questions you have and i was like ah, oh, okay so you know, i'm very impatient I, like if somebody gives me some recommendation <laughs> like that i'm not gonna like wait till i can order the book on amazon or something i'm gonna i'm just gonna google you know scott hahn <laughs> so what comes up what do you think comes up marcus the journey home <laughs> his episode, first episode on Journey Home. So I watched it on YouTube that night. Um, and, you know, I'm listening to what he has to say. And I'm going, yeah, okay. He talked to some about purgatory, which was interesting to me because that was one of the questions I had because that was one of these teachings that I was always taught that the Catholics just made up. And so, you know, he had some good points about it. And that, that was all. But it, nothing was really, it wasn't really grabbing me until right at the end. And he said something, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember it exactly, but he said something. When I was a Protestant, I used to think that a personal relationship with Christ was everything. And now I feel, why would you want to settle for just that? Those words were shocking to me. Mm. Why would you want to settle for a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? How could there be anything better than that? And what is he talking about? <laughs> so I went to bed that night with that in my mind. Now, previous, my friend had mentioned going to RCIA not to become converted, but just to get the information. And she'd given me this list of the top 10 reasons to be Catholic. And I looked at that list. And I'm like, eh, a good half of these are reasons I'm not going to become Catholic. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll just put that on the back burner. But I went to bed that night. And that what he said just was really haunting me. And I just, just started, it just sat there. And, and then again, the Holy Spirit just really was starting to speak to my heart and brought to mind John chapter 17, just out of the blue, John chapter 17, that they may be one. Remember that? Remember how you felt that that was hurt Christ's heart? Let's think about that. If you are going to design a church where Christ is the center and unity is paramount, what does that church look like? And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit just walked me through the top 10 reasons to be Catholic. Oh, I understand. I understand. That's why. That's why. <laughs> and then finally, what do you think number one is? The Eucharist. I had always thought, well, God could do that if he wanted to, but why would he? What's the point? And I, in that moment, I realized, oh, in my faith, it's always been we are united by the Holy Spirit. But human beings aren't just spirit. They're spirit and they're body. And Christ is defined as a second person of the Trinity by his incarnation. Hmm. So if we're truly going to be united to each other as brothers and sisters and to Christ, we need to be united both in the spirit and in the body, his body. Hmm. I was like, oh my gosh, you're there. You're actually there. They're right. And it was overwhelming. I was like, what do I do with this? What do I do with this? And again, I, I got out of my bed. So this actually happened in bed, <laughs> midnight to 3 a.m. I remember watching the clock a little bit. It's like midnight to 3 a.m. This is all going. This is all going. I got out of bed at 3 a.m. I kneeled down in my bathroom and I said, Lord, what do you want? What do you want for me? I want you to become Catholic. <laughs> yes, Lord. Yes. So. It was kind of fun, actually, to go tell my friend this because I, I sort of messed with her a little bit, I have to admit. <laughs> I brought the sheet with the top 10 reasons to be Catholic, and we went to a coffee shop, and I tell her about it, and I was like, so I went through all my pre-conversion arguments as to why these were a problem for me. And then I said, but that was before last night. And then I walked her through every single one and why I understood it and why I felt it was true, and this was the faith that I wanted to embrace. And at the end, I was like, when do we sign up for RCIA? Because I'm going to become Catholic. And she's like, 
<laughs> Subsequently, I asked her, I mean, were you really surprised? Were you super surprised? She's like, well, I was, but I wasn't because I prayed so hard that it would happen. And so it was just beautiful. Um, so that was, you know, I started RCIA and everything. And, um, Did you share it with your husband during that period? Well, I, you know, took a little bit of time and I shared it with him. And he, at first he was just confused by it because we've been doing this church hopping thing together. We were, this, we were in this together. And um, at first he was just confused. And then it was, became very hard, hmm. very hard for him. Because um, really, I think in the end, he felt like, he was kind of like, this is something we're united in as a family, and now you're choosing something that I don't want. Mm -hmm. So you're choosing, and I talked about the unity and all that, and he's like, but you're choosing unity of, with the church over unity with me. Mm -hmm. And so for a period of time, at the beginning of RCIA, I was like, okay, well, let's just kind of give it a go, and if it really isn't going to work out, if it causes so much trouble, causes so much strife between us, you know, maybe I won't do it. But the problem is every time I'm like uttered those words, maybe I won't do it, I'd start to cry. Now, I'm not a crier. Like, I'm not one of these women who tends to cry a lot. And so this was very disturbing for him and me <laughs> that this would happen. And so one day I just realized I have to, I have to. And as soon as I just admitted that to myself and then admitted it to him, I said, I, I don't know what's going to, how this is going to work out. But I just trust that God isn't going to call me to something that's going to be bad for my marriage. So um, he said, okay, you go, you do, but I'm not involved. Kids aren't involved. And I was like, okay, I'll do what I have to do. That's when the shoe kind of dropped hmm. in the sense that um, a month later, I found out that I had breast cancer. Hmm. And then three weeks after that, we found out my husband had recurrent testicular cancer. Whoa. And it's just the evidence of God's providence and his timing that he brought me where I needed to be in time for when I really, really needed him. Hmm. And I can tell you that during that period of time, as difficult as it was, both with our health and our marriage, I felt so upheld by the grace of God. He was so present to me. All those years of feeling empty in my prayer life were gone. Hmm. And there was a joy and there was a power in it because I knew that the way that I could live out my faith could then be a witness in these circumstances, which were very dramatic, that I could have um, confidence in God's love, that I trust in Him, and, and that He would carry me through it. And He really just did upheld me. And I even now I look back on this time, which is very hard, mm. with sort of a wistfulness of that intimacy I felt mm. with the Lord during that time. And uh, so... I'm, I'm thinking a little bit of... Of, of the chain of suffering because the, mm -hmm. the woman that awakened your heart herself right. was dealing with the same and, thing. Yeah, indeed. So, yeah. so eventually, you know, got through the year and it was a hard wait, you know, <laughs> very hard wait. And when you really believe in the Eucharist, you just long for it. You, you hunger for it. And I, I think that's, that is a blessing in a way you should always, yeah. Not, you, know, you don't want to take it for granted, and you can remember that hunger of how much you long for it. And when I received Christ for the first time, the only word I ever can use is, it wrecked me. I just, <laughs> it was like, just on the day that Christ passion, when that veil was torn, I feel like the veil between heaven and earth was just ripped, and that he was so present to me in such a beautiful, powerful way. And oh, how I just was so much joy, so much joy. and. Um, so, and it, I did feel home, for sure. That feeling of finally being where I was meant to be, felt it. And um, so over the years, you know, my, my husband's still not um, in the church, but he has come around to being so much more accepting and comfortable with it. Two years after I came into the church, my children were baptized Catholic, and, and now we live out that life very beautifully. And, and he's, you know, he's just the one who will be like, all right, y'all, you need to get going to Mass. It's time to get ready to go and, and everything. So, you know, I appreciate um, his heart and, and how he's uh, just come to be supportive and, and accept my faith. And um, so it's, it's been a beautiful journey. Hey. Because the time you had said that after your journey there was something important. You wanted well, it was to really talk. more that the the sense of after that moment of conversion, okay. there are these health things, and you just realize how yeah. I don't know how I would have gone through it without him. You know, in right. that entire period through four surgeries, my husband's surgery, his chemo, I had one moment of fear, right. 
It was night before my mastectomy, and I kneeled on the floor and I said, Lord, I'm afraid. <laughs> but he's just like, it's just there for you. you know, yeah. And so it was beautiful. You know, I'm thinking about that issue of suffering because when you're outside the church, um, there's so many opinions on how you fit your faith together mm -hmm. with the suffering and how do you understand God's will right. for your life and why, uh -huh. is, why is he doing this? But the Catholic understanding of that suffering is, a, is an important part of our walk with Christ. Absolutely. In fact, I've come to see suffering as the most profound, intimate invitation from mm -hmm. Christ. If you think about some of the holiest men and women of our faith, they gave, were given profound suffering and we're able to unite it to Christ in a really beautiful way. And uh, so in fact, this, um, the passion and uh, Stations of the Cross is probably the most deeply held devotion I have hmm. is to walk with Christ in his passion, daily remember his passion and, and feel the love that comes through that, just the knowledge of all he does for us and all the love he has for us. And well, the fact that you and I are on this uh, airway right now on television is because of the faith of a woman named Mother Angelica, who is also a woman that she dealt suffered. with suffering Absolutely. and uh, trusted in the Lord's constant mm -hmm. mercy with that, uh, saw that as a part of her journey that she was willing to offer up and mm -hmm. accept for, for this network. Right. Uh, and so we're very grateful for that. We have an email from Carrie from Alabama. Okay. What can I say to my non-Catholic friends who don't see the multitude of Christian denominations as a big deal? They think that the variety assures that everyone can find a comfortable home as a Christian and don't believe that the lack of unity is necessarily negative. Okay. Well, I would say sit with your friend, open the Bible, and read John chapter 17. All the things that we get worked up about in our faith as far as you know, abortion, gay marriage, euthanasia, all these things, Christ didn't pray specifically for those things. But if you read John chapter 17, which is called the high priestly prayer, what does he say? That we may be one, that they may be one. Praying for all of us, that they may be one, as you the Father and I are one, that they may be one. Why? So that the world may know that you sent me. His, the unity is that visible representation to humanity of our, his divinity, of the church, it, it, you cannot separate him. And that separation, it, it is it, a hindrance to our witness yeah. to Christ. He didn't desire it. This, it is against his will to be divided. And I feel that we should all long to be together. I think if you are just fine with the fact that there's these separations, if you're a Catholic and you're like, it's cool, you know, we all love the Lord, He's sad. It hurts his heart, and we should desire to reach out and, and bring that sense of unity together because he wants it so much. Because he, And if we see ourselves as truly brothers and sisters, not just in the spirit, but in the flesh and blood of Christ Jesus in the Eucharist, who, who are we to try to deny that to those who, they already love Christ, but they're missing out on the, the biggest part of what he wants to give us, fully himself. It's the lack of charity. Yeah, yeah. and we know that, uh, especially since Vatican II, the Catholic Church has been very committed to being in dialogue with our separated brethren with the goal of reaching mm -hmm. that unity, and that ought to happen. Uh, I'm not sure it will ever happen in our lifetime at that level, but... Right. But that's the, not what we have to worry the, about. The right? unity that you witnessed to was the witness of that friend of yours who was suffering, that shared mm -hmm. her faith with you, was willing Absolutely. to be with you to answer mm -hmm. your questions, was willing to say, well, right. I don't know that, I'll do a little bit more work. Yeah, but I think not. the most important part about that aspect of the story, it, it isn't anything that she told me, anything that, that she taught me, any of that. It was love. Yeah. That's what converts hearts. To go in and say, I want, I want to love you with Christ's love. And the work of conversion, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Our job is to love. That's what he says over and over again. And if you're a Catholic and you truly believe in Christ's presence in the Eucharist, to love another is to desire for them to experience that too. Our Lady? Love her. I never had any trouble with her. As soon as that night came and I understood why we have saints and what that, how that uni unites us and how we have these, that, that cloud of witnesses that are interceding for us, that we're never separated from those who, you know, just simply aren't 
present to us physically, but they're still very profoundly present to us spiritually. And uh, so never had, I didn't have a struggle with that at all. And in fact, I kind of joked around as like, I did eventually read Scott Hahn's book and I thought <laughs> it took him a lot longer to get to that than it took to me. So thanks, Holy Spirit. <laughs> that was a, a nice quick journey. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, this is a, a, maybe a wild question to ask on, on television, but dealing with your own suffering because of your surgeries mm -hmm. and all that, were you able to offer that up and understand that as a... Absolutely. And I think I've like more and more um, have come to see that, as I said, as, as a, an opportunity. Yeah. Um, like my, my spiritual director likes to say, it's beautiful to think of the cross, not as something that you're carrying, but something that's pressing you closer to Christ. Mm -hmm. And if we could all just look at suffering as that opportunity to be even more intimate with our Lord, because He is the suffering servant. And to know Him is to know suffering. It's a beautiful way to live. All right. Megan. Thank you so much, Mark. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for joining us on the journey home and sharing your journey. Thank and our you. prayers continue with you and your family. Appreciate God bless it. you. And thank you for joining us on this episode of the journey home. I do pray that Megan's journey is an encouragement to you to trust God. God bless you. See you next week.